tasting. One, two, three. Whoa. Strawberry, chocolate, vanilla. Amen. When they test the microphones, they always say one, two, three. I don't know why. They can't count past three, but what a joy it is to be a family. And uh, as you can tell, I've, uh, I'm a golfer's dream. I've got a hole in one, a hole in the bottom of my heel, so it made it a little awkward coming up the stairs. But uh, thank the Lord I had Pastor Milt helping me and my wife helping me. And uh, What a joy it is to see what God's doing among the nations of the world. And we're just look excited about sharing with you updates of what's happened as a result of your giving and your prayers. God is touching nations in such a powerful, vital way that he's changing the hearts of a generation. So we're, uh, they did a film for us in the Ukraine. This did not originate from our offices or from a U.S. perspective. This originated in the Ukraine from their perspective, and they kind of used our name in vain. They kept on using the name Richard and Sarah Mahalski, Richard and Sarah. After the second time, I would get bored with that, so endure, endure that part. But you can see the highlights of 35 years, 45 years of ministry in four, three minutes. How about that? Amen. Can we start that film? Healing from diseases, injuries, and emotional wounds. Make us your son and your daughter. We give you our whole life. Thank you, Jesus, for dying on the cross for me. Richard and Sarah serve a lot in the Great Commission Church. So Richard and Sarah Mahalski, it's all about Jesus. And uh, thank you for your prayers over these years and God's faithfulness in the harvest. Uh, we like to share our testimony. Hallelujah. It's a joy to be here this morning. And I don't like the Richard and Sarah, Richard and Sarah. It's the body of Jesus Christ that is the family of Christ that is, you know, um, pulled together with um, the mission that, you know, we've started, oh, many, many moons ago, Impact Ministries. But I just want to thank you, thank you for being a part, you know, of uh, thousands upon thousands of lives that have come to Christ. And um, our main, you know, emphasis and goal is still the Word of God. Because the Word of God, it is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. And um, uh, just, you know, when we were in Ukraine, um, this last summer, I remember the we still, you know, not only you know supporting and have several orphanages, but um, there were our main emphasis was still the Word of God. And unfortunately, we try to bring some samples here, and we've been buying these um, Kevlar-like Bibles, you know, New Testaments, and they're you know kind of waterproof, almost fi well fireproof and um, tearproof. And so anyway, we've had a few samples. But um, eventually, you know, people have just been kind of taking them, unfortunately, and we keep telling them these are only samples that we brought from Russia, from Ukraine, you know, just to show people what we've been, you know, what people have been helping us to purchase for, you know, the people in Russia and Ukraine. And so we had one left in Kodiak, and, um, and it's disappeared on us now. So anyway, um, but I just want to, you know, share just a little, you know, testimony. We were on the radio uh, just a couple weeks ago, uh, you know, a Christian radio broadcast, a Russian radio broadcast, and a lady had called in, somebody that I had not, we had not seen for many, many years, but as we used to smuggle Bibles into Russia, we never, ever hid the Bibles. We always just depended on the Lord to lead us, you know, to the Christians. And we depended the Lord to, you know, overshadow his word, to protect it and to help us to get it into the Soviet bloc. And I saw, you know, on the map it says, Sesese uh, Ar, and you saw me when I was, you know, in my 20s there. Well, that's you know, we started when I was 19 years of age. But I remember in those early years, there were many times where we would literally see God blind the guards' eyes. The Bibles would be there in the trunk of the car. They'd be, you know, loaded from the seat up to the ceiling. And the guards would be checking the, you know, the, um, the car thoroughly. And yet so many times they did not see them. And you know, God, as he called us, he also, you know, he provided, provided miracle after miracle after miracle. But there were times that we were arrested when they did 
catch, you know, took the Bibles. But, you know, um, one of these occasions, I remember we were going into Russia, and I was pregnant at that time. And I was six months along with our third son. And, you know, the doctor said you could never have children. Well, Dr. Jesus made it different. He made a difference. And God gave us four children. And so anyway, here I'm pregnant six months along. And uh, as we come to the, you know, to the Russian border, to the border there, um, we always would pre, you know, we would prepay our stay in Russia. You had to do that in those early years under communism. And so anyway, so here we had, you know, prepaid ahead of time. And at the border, they arrested Richard. They took him, and I did not see him for 21 days. Now, when you're pregnant and in a communist country, and you don't know where your husband is, it can get kind of scary. But, you know, God's people, they interceded. They prayed on our behalf. And we could not notify our parents. We could not notify the body of Christ in America saying, hey, you know, my husband is under arrest. Can you come and help, you know, to, you know, get him out? You, we couldn't, we had no access to, you know, doing that. But the Holy Spirit is the greatest access. He is the, our defense, and he's the one that will speak to hearts and lives, and that's why we believe that we are alive today, and that's why I believe God set you know, us free time and time again because of the body of Jesus Christ. But as Richard was being held back, I, you know, I continued on into Russia, and as I came into, you know, we had pre- you know, assigned hotels that we had to stay in, that we had to prepay ahead of time. And so they gave us vouchers, and you present the voucher when you came to the hotel. So anyway, I come to the hotel, and, you know, the next morning I said, well, God, you know, I still don't have my husband. I don't know where he's at. I don't know what's happened to him, but I do know that you called us, you know, to this place. You've called us to this field. You've called us to help these people in this land with the word of God. And somehow they did not check my luggage. They did not check my bags. So I had tons of Bibles. So anyway, I came through with my Bibles. And so the next morning as I'm walking down with some satchels, and I said, God, I don't have any address. Usually, you know, my husband will just say, okay, hon, let's go here or there, you know, just wherever God would lead by his Holy Spirit. So I was praying and I said, okay, God, I'm just dependent on the Holy Spirit to just direct me to your believers. We had no addresses, no names. And so as I'm walking down the road, all of a sudden, these two young ladies, they tapped me on the shoulder and they said, Sister Sara." you know, Sister Sarah, and I turned around, and I had never met them, and so they said, and one was 16 years of age, and the other was 17 years of age, Lily and Nadia, and they said, we are so-and-so, and I said, and who are you, and they said, you know, the Holy Spirit told them ahead of time on such a day and such a time to come, and the Holy Spirit told them, and you're going to meet a young lady called Sister Sarah, and so here they were tapping me on the shoulder, first time. And so I just, you know, we embraced and they said, come and follow us. So I followed them and they said, we're just going to go a short while. But there were times we have to run, you know, into this bush or run into over here. So here I am, six months along, you know. And so we're going, you know, you know, we're running over here, over there. And they said, dodge. So I dodge, you know, in the bushes. And then they say, okay, come on out. So I'm coming out, you know, and, you know, with a big belly like that. You know, it wasn't all that easy. And then they took my satchels and they said, oh, we'll only just be walking a little distance two hours later, and you're going in, you know, potholes, you know, these, you know, alleys and so forth. And so anyway, they finally brought me into these woods. And in the woods, there was a whole gathering of believers. And these gathering of believers had been waiting there for me to come. And God had already spoken to them ahead of time about, you know, a Westerner coming by the name of Sarah. And so when, we, when I came with these sisters, they just all dropped on their knees, and we just began to pray. And as, I mean, it was like the Shekinah glory just came down. And the first thing the pastor began to prophesy, you know, and the Lord began to speak saying, you know, I have your husband under control, and you will be reunited with your husband. 
I mean, he did not know that was the first time I had ever met him, you know, or, you know, seen him. And, and here the Holy Spirit just began to, you know, just you know, just speak peace and, you know, tell about the things that were going to happen. And the Holy Spirit said, and God, that he was going to use my husband in that place to meet, to lead many, many people to Jesus Christ. And in 21 days, he led over 400 people to Jesus Christ. Our ways are not the same as God's ways. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. But, you know, within that service in the woods, I remember as we were just worshiping the Lord, all of a sudden these men, they came. And the pastor, he said, and he had asked me to just share the word. And I said, well, pastor, I'm not a preacher. He said, you know, you have the Bible in your land. We don't have the Bibles. That pastor didn't even have a Bible. And God allowed me to bring all these Bibles. And he had the first Bible in his life. He had just come out of prison for his faith in Jesus Christ. And, you know, and as I remember just opening my mouth, I said, okay, God, I just ask you to just fill my mouth and let the word of God come out. And it was just scripture after scripture after scripture. And what those people do is they bring notepads, you know, notebooks, and and they write the scripture by hand. And that's what they were doing. And I saw all these notebooks, and I saw, you know, with pencils, And they're all writing down the scripture as I'm rehearsing it, as I'm telling it to them. And I thought, wow, God, the word of God truly was so precious and is so precious. And so as I'm sharing the pastor, he goes, Sister Sarah, you've got to stop now. I said, and I thought, oh, great. I, I'm in, uh, I want to stop, you know. And so he said, you see these men that have just come here. He said, these last few men, he said, they have come here to arrest you and to arrest me, because this is an illegal service. This is considered an unregistered service. And when, you know, in those years, for the pastor, the person in charge, and anyone sharing was in prison minimum three and a half years maximum death. And so he said, you know, before you men take us, he said, can we just get on our knees and pray? And they said, well, you better make it quick. So we got on our knees on the dirt there in the woods. And as we began to pray, all of a sudden, this little elderly lady began to prophesy. And she said, have no fear of your enemy, but have the fear of God. For God says, I have put a wall of fire around you, and the enemy will not harm you. Well, some of those men had pistols on them, and they could have shot her right there on the spot. And they've done that to so many Christians, you know, in the past. And yet God's power just came in such a mighty, mighty dimension that those men, those KGB guys, they fled in different directions. And they couldn't handle the power of God. For you see, greater, greater is the power of God in you than he that is in the world. Greater is he, greater is Jesus in us than he that is in the world. God tells us that our weapons are not carnal, but they are mighty through God. Mighty through God, through the pulling down of the strongholds. And friends, as they interceded and prayed, God began to break down those strong and tear down those strongholds. Well, after some time... The pastor said, well, let's just pray, you know, for this one sister and her two children. And her two children were deformed and crippled, and the lady herself was also crippled. And so as we began to pray and agree together, all of a sudden I heard, and those two little kids, they were about eight years of age, and those two little kids were, you know, just right near me. And all of a sudden I heard the crackling of bones And as I heard the crackling of bones, I opened my eyes to see those legs that were all deformed and crippled just straighten out. And God did a miracle of healing those children and the mother. Our God is an awesome God. He is the, you know, he's the author and the finisher of our faith. And so, and he healed the mother. And then after this healing, I remember this one man, he came. And as he came from, you know, somewhere from wherever he you know, came from. And he said, well, my men could not arrest you, showing to me and to the pastor. But he said, since my men could not arrest you, he said, some power took over them and they had to flee. 
And so he said, but I have come here personally to arrest you, pointing to the pastor, and to arrest your visitor. And the pastor, he said, can we just pray real quickly? Well, he said, this will be your last prayer. Little did I realize until afterwards the pastor shared how when he was in prison for 10 years for his faith in Christ, this was the man that had tortured him, that had beaten him day after day after day. And he would tell him, deny your faith in Christ and you will be released. And this pastor, he said, I will never deny my faith in Christ. And the Lord spoke to him and said, you'll only serve 10 years. And after 10 years, this man will write the release for your you know, imprisonment, release you. But there will come a day when he will come to one of the services in the woods and he will surrender his heart to Jesus Christ. Well, he had shared this afterwards. And so as we began to pray, and this man, he said, this will be your last prayer well, as we began to pray, all of a sudden, God began to soften that hardened, hardened heart. Uh, you know, there's nothing too hard for our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, a KGB officer, KGB man who, you know, all his life, he said, I don't believe in God. But when the Holy Spirit, when the power of God, you know, touched his heart, touched his soul, broke down that wall, broke down that partition within, you know, that hardness within his heart, and God melted it, all of a sudden that man just embraced the pastor. He said, do you think you can forgive me. He said, I have the blood of so many saints on my hands. He said, I want this Jesus. I want his redemption. I want him to forgive me. And he prayed and prayed and wept and asked Christ to come into his heart. And I just want you to know those two sisters, they said, that man today is a pastor. And those sisters, they said, we have learned to trust God, to believe God. And God would give that bread, you know, not just to us, but, you know, to share it with other people. And those two young ladies, Lily, she said, I just, we're, I'm just visiting the United States. But she said, my husband and I, she's married. She said, and we have planted many, many churches within the former Soviet Union. Friends, let that fruit abound. But I just want you to know that you have been a part of literally the Lord's allowed us to put in over 6 million Bibles throughout Russia, the Islamic Republics, and we're still pressing in for God, God's word. It changes lives. It changes and destroys the enemy's strongholds. And so I just encourage you to press in with us, believe with us, and I thank you for standing in the gap on our behalf. God bless you. Amen. Amen. Wow. Whew. 45 years of God's faithfulness gets a little overwhelming when you rehearse it. The Bible said, taste and see the Lord is good and count your blessings one by one. And the farmer didn't quite hear that right. And he started saying, count your blessings, weigh them ton by ton. I just feel overwhelmed sometimes just reflecting on the faithfulness of God over a lifetime. We do have testimonies of our books on the back table, and uh, Tears of Triumph is my testimony. Fire by Night is Sarah's testimony. And we have a book that's extremely politically incorrect called Communist Comedy Relief. Very timely in light of the elections. There's a quote in there by Ronald Reagan that said, uh, Socialism only works in two places, in heaven where they don't need it, and in hell where they originated it. There's also stories from the, out of the communist era, and unfortunately, the laugh is on us because we're making the same mistakes with the same biblical consequences, and that's imperative. Heaven and earth pass away, but the word of the Lord, the, God's word will never pass away. So let's turn to that word, and uh, if you have your Bible, turn with me to Psalms 107. The sale of these books help us with purchase those military New Testaments. We just bought last year 10,000 in Russian and 10,000 Ukrainian, and to both sides of the war zone. We figure if someone reads that New Testament, finds the Prince of Peace, their war is over. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Psalms 107, turning our focus attention from verse 17 to verse 21. Fools 
because of their transgression and their iniquity are afflicted. They abhor all manner of meat, and they draw near to the gates of death. They cry out to the Lord in their trouble, and he hears them in their, in their distress. He sent his word and healed them of their diseases. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his wonderful works to the children of men. The first reference we read in the 17th verse is the word fools. And the Bible cautions us very strongly to not use that word with, without focus. The Bible says not to call our brother a fool without a cause. But once in a while, God calls humanity a fool, and there is a cause. And the cause is found in the 14th chapter of Psalms and verse 1, where it says, The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Psalms 53 in verse 1 renders it slightly different in some translations and says, The fool has said in his heart, no God for me. That adds a little bit different meaning, doesn't it? So in light of that, in the former Soviet Union, an experiment was done of atheism and communism, and one of the premises of communism is we have no other allegiance except the state. We worship the state, they're totally dependent on the state, and if you worship God, you're foolish. But God says the opposite is true. Those that do not believe in God and do not have a worldview with God the center of it are foolish indeed. And so we have a bumper crop of fools raising up in the Soviet Union that made foolish statements like, our cosmonauts went into space and saw no footprints of God, so therefore there is no God. Wow. One school teacher told that to the classroom, and the little Ivan, a Christian brother, raised his hand and said, wait a minute, wait a minute, teacher, were the cosmonauts' hearts pure? What do you mean? Well, the Bible said, without a pure heart, no man will see God. In, in the concept of the ages, to deny the existence of God is folly indeed. And the Bible says the reason their understanding is darkened is because of their iniquity and their transgression. Transgression means you cut across or cut over the known law of God and you willfully violated God's law. But iniquity is something hidden within. The Bible says concerning Satan, iniquity was found in his heart. Deep, dark, hidden sin in the inner man birthed in the very nature of man himself. And the Bible says because of that, they, they didn't attain, they didn't want any food, no nurture, no instruction, no clarity. They despised it and brought them to the point of destruction. The wages of sin are death, but the gift of God is eternal life. So when they come down to the point where they're dying, they cried unto the Lord in their trouble, and it should rightfully say, God said from heaven, you made your bed, lie in it. But how many of you know you and I do not serve a God of that malicious nature? He's a merciful God. So when they cried unto the Lord in their trouble, near the gates of death, the Bible said he, he sent his word, and he healed them. He had mercy on them. He opened up the heavens and responded to their cry. How do you know the sinner's cry is one God always hears? When it comes from repentance in its contrite heart, the Spirit of God longs for the time to welcome you in his everlasting arms and bring you into the arms of his grace. He longs to wash your sins by the power of his covenant of blood and transform you to son and daughter of the living God. One of the great transactions that happens at that moment is the entering in of the Word of God. Faith does not come by fasting, although that's a great regiment. It doesn't come by, uh, doesn't come by prayer. That's a great thing to do. But faith only comes by the vehicle of hearing. And in the continuous tense in the Hebrew, in, in the book of Hebrews, it should read faith comes by hearing and hearing and hearing and hearing and hearing. It's not enough to hear it once. I've got it, man. I've, I've read the book. I hear people tell me, well, I've read the Bible from cover to cover. You ask me a few questions, obviously you didn't get very far past the cover. But the Word of God is something you can delve into a whole lifetime, and the layers of revelation are so deep and so profound. I've been a student of the Word of God for 55 years, and I've come to the final conclusion, I know so little. Because it's God's Word. It's endless. 
but he sends it out. He says, my word, it is spirit and is life. He sends his word and heals them. Now, people without a clarity of a God-centered world's view don't understand the workings of God. And they watched a pastor before perestroika in the Soviet Union, and they watched he laid hands on the sick, and Jesus would honor that. The more we can do to line up with God's word, the more God shows up to verify and vindicate his word. So it says, if any be sick among you, call for all of the church. It talks about the prayer of faith. She'll save the sick and the Lord shall raise them up. It talks about laying hands upon them. It talks about anointing them with oil. So the more of those things we can do, the more God is open to our heart to see they're lining up with my word. My children are believing my word. So therefore, I'm going to come on the scene and verify and vindicate my word. So they watched this man. He laid hands on the sick and said, hey, we can stop that. They rammed a law through because they didn't have Congress to worry about. And they said, you can no longer lay hands upon the sick in this entire provincial area. That'll stop the moving of God, they thought, smugly. Boy, were they mistaken. The pastor, he said, Lord, I know Romans 13, where the government bears not the sword in vain, and I'm supposed to obey the governments because they're ordained of God, and I tried my best to... Get rendered to Caesar that which is Caesar's. I have a problem with this one, Lord. They violated the scripture. The Bible says they shall lay hands upon the sick and they shall recover. Now they say I can't do that. How am I going to handle a service on Sunday morning? Lord basically told him, son, chill out. I'm going to do it my way, he said. So Sunday morning comes, this pastor is full of anticipation and full of anxiety at the same time because the spies are out in the congregation from the KGB. They look like Christians, they smell like Christians, but they aren't Christians. I've seen some of these spies in a personal close encounter. They, they, they memorize scripture. They can throw a few scriptures at you. They'll sing the songs without a songbook. They know the, song, the hymns of the church. But, you know, one of them even went as far as kneeling next to me and faking speaking in tongues. And something welled up in my spirit and said, that's not of God. He was, at the same time speaking in tongues, he was frisking me with his elbows under my coat to see if he could find some Bibles. The other man refused to kneel, so obviously he stood like a neon sign in a church and everybody was kneeling. But in this service, the KGB were planted in the back of the church, and they watched carefully. Now, if he talked about Israel being afflicted by the Philistines, ah, we know who he's talking about. We're the Philistines. They're talking about us. So he took his text very prayerfully and carefully, and the moment came when the anointing level, because the word went out. There's something about faith building in the word when it goes out. When it was built at a certain point, God was ready to move in the hearts of people. Their hearts were responding. Their spirits were ready. And the word of the Lord came to him and said, Now, son, stand up and send the word of the Lord across this people, and I'll heal by my word. He spoke a word of knowledge. It was like a wave. Whoosh! Hit that congregation, hit the back wall, and came back the other way. Almost took the pastor off his feet. The KGB is standing there stunned. How, how do you respond to that? He didn't lay hands on anybody. But there's hundreds of people instantly being healed by the power of God. Wow. What happened here? Can you imagine those guys having a tough time explaining this to the superiors when they got home? Well, we, we, we were there, all right. We watched very carefully. No, nope, he didn't lay hands on anybody. But miracles still kept on happening. Healings, salvation all at a response to God's immutable, eternal word. Wow. I've seen that word take hold of lives that I'd given up on. I was just in California, Sarah and I, a couple of weeks ago in Sacramento on our way home, and I had the chance to stop into a home of a couple who I'd led to the Lord 50 years ago. Whoa, that's a long time ago. Doug and Skeeter are counselors with PhDs, uh, which means post hole digger, at some of the prominent churches in Southern California in, in the Sacramento. He's written 17 books. His wife 
wrote 10 books because she's so meticulous. It took her 10 years to write her book, and she wordsmithed every word. Uh, but here we are talking about Skeeter's experience with, with the Lord. And I, I met her 50 years prior in a friend's home or visiting the friend, and she happened to drop in to visit and their neighbors. And uh, I started talking spiritual things with her, but unfortunately she was a, a, a Ph.D. in philosophy. So we talked Nietzsche and nihilism and existentialism, and I'm totally out of my element. I felt like a duck out of water. And she talked this and talked that, and we're going around circles. We were around circles for two hours. In frustration, no other reason but frustration, I said, Skeeter, could you do me a favor? Could you just read the third chapter of John? Well, Richard, I'm a PhD. I can read. I said, I know you can read. I just want to hear how you treat it with your voice inflection, with your emotion. Just read the third chapter, John. She didn't get through the third chapter, John. She broke down and began to sob. She said, I need Jesus. I said, exactly. I prayed the sinner's prayer with her, and they were beautifully saved. Later on, her husband came to faith in Christ, and uh, the first year they got saved, they, they carried a whole box of New Testaments in the back seat. They did something you normally shouldn't do in the Seattle area. They picked up hitchhikers. It's a great deal because you've got a captive audience. They can't jump out of the car at 40 miles an hour. So you can share Jesus all the way home. They led 120 people to Christ in their first year of salvation. There's something about that word. I've seen an Islamic republic where well, they said, Richard, we don't want you here. I got the word there first, and they got curious about the author of the book. We come into the Islamic republics like Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, Kyrgyzstan, and we found as we saturated those places with the word of God, let them matriculate for a month or two into their heart, into their spirits. They start opening its pages, and they start reading the life of God came out of those pages because this becomes a rhema word rather than a logos word after your heart's content, uh, open to it. And so as the rhema word began to get a hold of them, they said, wow, can you explain this passage? Can you explain that passage? It even happened in my, my uncle, my uncle in Germany, Otto is his name. Uncle Otto was a Lutheran, a very staunch Lutheran, but not saved. And some Jehovah Wit, sorry, some uh, Mormons came to his house. And every time they came to the kitchen door, Magda, his wife, would cramp over the stomach pains. She said, I don't feel good. Could you just leave? You come back tomorrow. This happened for 30 days straight. Every day she cramped up and they left. Then she cramped up and they left. The minute they left, the cramps left. It was God's supernatural way of preserving him from error and from heresy. And so Otto said, you know, I'm not a Christian, but I need to defend the faith. So I'm going to read the New Testament. God set him up. By the time the end of the month had come, he'd read to the book of Revelation, and he was terrified what he read in the book of Revelation. So he had some questions. I would say he had some questions. And then the questions we talked together for an entire day from 9 o'clock in the morning to 10 o'clock at night. And I am exhausted. Besides that, they were chain smokers. They smoked three packs of cigarettes each a day. So my lungs hurt for a week after visiting them. And I'm saying, Lord, I want to get out of here. We're staying at a Christian resort just about 10 kilometers away. I'd like to get back to the resort, get back to people that are, are or don't smoke. And the Lord said, son, you're here for a divine appointment. You're here for a purpose. At 10 o'clock at night, Otto turns to me and says, I'm ready. I said, so am I. Will you take me home? He said, no, I don't want to take you home. I said, oh, boy, what's going to happen? He said, I'm ready. I, said, I heard that. You're ready for what? I'm ready to find Jesus as my Savior. So he got his knees with Magda. And their son, Martin, all three of them, the whole family, got swept in the kingdom of God. That word is immutable. It's eternal. Never returns back lifeless or void. Brings back 30, 60, 100-fold return. It's powerful. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. Heaven and earth pass away, but the word of the Lord shall never pass away. So in this Islamic republic, we got the word out there, and we found out it it piqued their curiosity. Who is this Jesus? Can you tell us more about him? We see him in the pages of the New Testament, and he's such a powerful figure. Is he a prophet? Is he more than a prophet? 
what an opportunity to present the risen Christ. We had a group of 21 spirit-filled Mennonites coming from Germany who spoke Russian and German. They came out with us. They were our, our team. They helped us in prayer and with Bible distribution. We carried in 25,000 New Testaments everywhere we went. And one time we got the wrong boxcar, so we loaded up the wrong boxcar, only to find out we had to unload it within 10 minutes. We'd open the window and dump boxes out on the platform and ran down the end of the train, got the right boxcar. It was a mess. I, I was lean and mean in those days, and I was a real fighting machine. But at the en end of th this period, we found, we came into these Islamic republics, and I found God supernaturally had piqued their thirst and their hunger. I call it God salted their souls. They were so thirsty for reality, for the living God. In their desperation, they turned to occult practices like Kasparovsky, a, a prominent occultist of the Soviet Union. They bought his creams. Whoever bought the creams, their hands would shrivel up. Whoever drank his water, they couldn't speak anymore. They're mute by demonic power. So we'd come in there, and if I got one shot at an audience, and I willfully know that I'm never, ever going to get back there again, I'm going to preach the blood of Jesus, God's covenant son, destroys all sin. I, I, it does more havoc to Satan's kingdom in a shorter time frame than any topic in the Word of God. So I preached the blood. Well, I was preaching the blood to an entirely Islamic audience in one of my cities, the first city. I start hearing this crackling sensation. I said, wow, snap, crackle, and pop. What in the world is going on out there? found out the close of the service while I was preaching the blood of Jesus, their hands that were distorted and grotesquely twisted began to straighten out. That was the popping sound. Their tongues, the mute, were loosed. And they're crying out, Jesus, 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 forgive us. Jesus, be merciful to us. When God began to heal them, it messed up my theology. I said, God, they've got to get saved first. We explain the cross to them. They've got to pray the sinner's prayer. And down the road, eventually we'll get to the healing department. But first, this is priority. This is numero uno. And God said, son, crumbs still fall off my table and heal the unregenerate. I'm a merciful God. I'm a powerful God. As they were getting their healing, it was an easy se uh, uh, sequence from healing to salvation. Hey, if this person just healed you, his name is Jesus Christ. Number one, he's alive. Number two, he has power more than your Quran gives him attribute to, because the Quran said he's a good prophet, and his distinction is power to heal. So he's something more than this. And if a good prophet's a good prophet, he doesn't lie. So what does it say about him? It calls him Emmanuel, God with us. So he's more than a prophet. He's the God in the flesh. And so what began to transpire is the Holy Spirit, because they were healed, brought them to salvation. And when the whole entire opera house emptied of Muslims right down the altar, crying out, dropping on these, and coming to faith in Christ, tears flowing down their face, I realized I was in a God moment. 1,976 Muslims, bam, coming forward at a full rush. They were never to your church. You've got a beautiful red line here. I don't, I don't think that refers to football. I think that's a holy line at the altar. I like that. They weren't at your church. They didn't know how far forward to come. When I invited them forward, they joined me on the platform. They joined me in the aisles. They joined me all across the front. There's no room anymore. They're packed out the whole entire front of the church. And when they began to pray, my heart sank within me because I looked behind me and this great big huge circular stage with hydraulic lifts would sunk in the middle about 18 inches. I said, God, if they drop the knees, they're going into the basement. It won't hold the load of shifting from standing to kneeling. So, God, I'm not going to ask the kneel too late. They all dropped on the knees. Yours truly prayed a prayer of faith in unbelief. Let me qualify that. I was asking the prayer of the prayer of salvation, believing in God. At the same time, I had one eye closed for reference and one eye open to see what would happen to them. Well, the Bible does give us precedence for that. It says watch and pray, right? Amen. So I watched and prayed. 
As they got on their knees, the Spirit of God dropped on them like rain. I've never seen anything like this before. One moment, far from God, distant from their faith, they heard the word and responded with their heart. And now tears are streaming down their faces without being told. Hands are going in the air. They're crying out, Jesus, 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 have mercy on me. How have you know God heard that cry? God heard that cry. And my heart said, oh, God, what have you done here? And the Lord said, I gave them their heart's desire. They cried unto the Lord in their trouble. And he heard them at the moment of their distress, at the moment of their dying. God brought them life and, and, and the message of life in the gospel of Jesus Christ. That was the first night of 14 nights in Islamic republics and 10,000 souls later, they're still coming. They're still coming. I was never invited back there again. They wouldn't allow Sir and I to return. We're persona non grata for Islamic republics and the Soviet Union. But that doesn't mean the word can't get there. We put 300,000 Bibles in Uzbekistan after we left. We put 500,000 Bibles in other Islamic republics. Hundreds of Bibles into Kazakhstan. 1.3 million Bibles in Kazakhstan that bridge the border into China. That seed of the word, that immutable, eternal seed of the word, it has quick and powerful as it's sown in that land. When we entered Uzbekistan, they had only eight churches in the entire nation, a strong Muslim nation. After those crusades, and after I put 395,000 Bibles in there, six years later, what happened? 112 churches. The master builder had gone before us and declared, I shall build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The master builder builds on his word. The foundation, the bedrock of his church is the living word of God. You're living stones in God, built up as a mighty edifice of God's mercy and grace. What's happening among the nations in this hour is the word is being cultivated with signs following. And what do we do in response to that? Oh, that men... Oh, the dust. For, forgive me. Let me have a Richard Mahalski translation of this verse, will you? Oh, the dust would bless divinity, for his works full of wonder among the children of dust. What an honor. What a high privilege for you and I, mortal clay and dust, to exalt our maker who is eternal spirit and truth. He looks for a people. He seeks out a generation. He searches out for a people who worship him, for he is a spirit. So he seeks out a people who worship him in spirit and in truth. Have you ever heard people that just recently were saved? Didn't have all the verses of the hymn down? but they sang from their hearts. I, f I met the Panamanian church for the first time some years ago. We've been back there on numerous occasions, the most recent being just last year. And when they sing, I was so overwhelmed because everyone just sang with everything that was in them. I so enjoyed your response in the worship and praise. I heard the interaction, a shout here, a hallelujah there. And I love that when we respond, as Pastor Milt was talking about, with our passion in God. Don't ever let that passion die. It's that purity of heart to God relationship and praise and worship that touches the heart of God. I listen to these Panamanians sing, and this Hosanna Church in Panama City is a, quite a sizable church of 5,000 members. They meet in four times on a weekend, each time 5,000. They've got a 20,000-member church. But when they began to tell me, Richard, now we're believing God. We're just trusting God for just a couple new hundred candidates and missions. So believe with us. Trust God with us. When I had the altar call, the first service, I had 5,000 people respond to missions. I said, wait a minute. Maybe they didn't know how to get it. So let me try it one more time. You're going to overseas. You're going wherever God wants you to go, across the street, across the city, across the world, and you're available now to serve God in that capacity. They all came forward. I said, whoa, 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 whoa. 
And then the Lord said, son, did you hear them when they sang? I said, yeah. To begin with, I think every Panamanian is an opera singer. They hit notes that I can never hit this side of eternity. But the tears flowing down their face, hands in there, they were lost in God. They weren't listening to the, the crystal clear tones of the person next to them. They were listening to the voice of God saying, Son, I blessed you. I've graced you. I've given you health. I've given you salvation. Worship and praise my name. As they were locked in on God and the heavens opened to them because God inhabits the praise of his people. He condescends and comes down upon healing start happening by the bucketfuls. I'm standing there and bawling my brains out because it's a God hour. He's taken over and sovereignly begin to minister to his people. Then the testimonies would roll back. Oh, I love the testimonies. Giving honor and glory to Jesus. With a name like Mahalski to Latino, it's really hard to pronounce. What you can't pronounce, you can't remember, which is great. I want only one name to be remembered, and that being the name of Jesus Christ. He deserves all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise. So we see something breaking loose from the heart of God. There's a new anthem of praise and worship. Bogota, Colombia has a new sound. Pastor Ricardo, in Bogota, Colombia, some short years ago, remembered by point of reference that was the cocaine-cutting capital of the world. It's revival center Latin America right now. They had a gathering in a central square some years back, short years ago, and they wanted to find out what God had done in the city. One million people showed up in the middle of the square. One little teensy-weensy, itsy-bitsy problem, it rained cats and dogs. When they began to worship, when they began to praise, God punched a hole through the clouds. Only in the square where they were gathered, it did not rain. For three and a half hours, it did not rain. Over them was a double rainbow in that opening of the sky. God sealing it with his presence and saying, I receive the praise of my people. I hear you, my sons and my daughters. You're worshiping me in spirit and in truth. It's one thing in a house of faith to praise God within the four walls. It's one thing to be gathered with the assembly of the redeemed and reflect on his faithfulness over a lifetime. But it's quite something else to carry that beyond the four walls of the church and lift your voice at the marketplace, on the job, in the avenue, wherever you go, unashamed of the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ for it's the power of God unto salvation. It's quite something else when your life is on the line and yet you still praise God. It's been my awesome privilege for 45 years to minister in, in lands of persecution. And I've learned something. He still gives a song of the night. Out of the prison cell, Paul and Silas sang, and they're still singing in prisons today. Unashamed of the name of Jesus. Unashamed of the purity of his power. As they lift those anthems from souls redeemed, from lips that have been purged by the blood of the Lamb, God receives it into heaven like a sweet-smelling savor, ascending the very throne room of God himself. The song of the Lord rises and swells among the nations in this hour. So join the chorus, join heaven's choir, and join the majestic myriads of saints gone on before with the saints on earth, and magnify his name. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his wondrous works to the children of men. I don't know what you have to be thankful for, but I get overwhelmed. I look over my shoulder, and I think of the psalmist David when he said, the lines of my life have fallen into pleasant places. I don't deserve any of the grace I received, the mercy he's shown me, the confirmation of the word I've seen with my own eyes. What a deal. I give him a hunk of clay, he redeems it, gives me the word which isn't mine, is his word. He overshadows that word with the Holy Spirit and signs following, and I get to watch him work among the sons of men. I'm in awe. I'm an awesome wonder. It gets stronger 
and stronger and stronger. One of the words the Lord's been speaking into my spirit for about three years now, the Lord said, Ecuador, Ecuador, Ecuador. I said, okay, God, I don't know anybody in Ecuador. He said, that's not a prerequisite. I'm putting Ecuador in your hearts, on your heart. He said, I said, why, Lord? He said, I've called three people to Ecuador. You're one of them. I said, God, why me? I'm a gringo. My total command of Spanish is Alleluia, taco, and tortilla. He said, your heart is for missions and for the world. I said, okay, what are you doing, Lord, in Ecuador? And this is what the Lord spoke to me. He said, son, I'm causing a thirst in their soul to mount up. There's a cry that's coming out of Ecuador to the throne of God. I'm hearing it. It's like vials being filled up and their prayers about to be dumped upon that land. He said, when they're really ripe and their heart is really ready, I'll send the three of you. I don't know who the other two are. I'll send the three of you to Ecuador. I'm mulling this over in my heart. I've finished a series of services in Panama. I'm out for an evening meal with my wife and my interpreter, Vincente. And I ask the blessing over the meal. A couple leaves from across the restaurant comes over a table and said, You're Christians. Yes, we are. We saw you pray. He said, uh, You don't mind me being forward. I said, No, go ahead. He said, uh, Could you please come to our nation? I said, What nation is that? Ecuador. I said, well, why would you invite me to Ecuador? He said, I'm the director for evangelism for the whole nation of Ecuador. I said, God, those seed thoughts were watered by your Holy Spirit, nurtured by your presence. The Word came alive in me, and now it's time in a season to see it fulfilled. I began to prophesy in Panama. I said, Lord, this nation is going to see a visitation from you. Though it's the least of Latin America, there's going to be a supernatural covering over this land, just like there was over Bethlehem, thou Bethlehem, Judah. Though there'll be the least of the thousand of Judah, yet out of thee shall be shown a great light. In that little nation, I said, you're looking to the nations around you. Colombia in revival. Argentina is still the longest world sustained revival, 20 years and counting. Chile in the midst of moves of God. We see Costa Rica, Honduras, moved by God. Places in Mexico like Chihuahua, on fire for God. Something's breaking loose in the nations. And it's the song of the Lord that whelms up from the heart of the redeemed that swelled in the courts of God. In response, God gushes down with his power and presence and said, I'll abide, I'll tabernacle there. I'll live where you're at because you're worshiping me in spirit and in truth. So I told the Panamanians, I said, I see something in God. I see such a holy saturation presence upon your land that people come into Panama City, the, they'll start crying at the, about the 30,000 feet level when they start the descent into town. The pilots will, will be, be weeping. The phenomena will be a novelty on the front page of your papers the first time around, it'll be commonplace after a few months because it'll be the norm. The Spirit of God will be so powerful and so present. You'll be a destination vacation for people from around the world to meet with God. I said, oh, Richard. I said, here's the signs. There'll be natural shakings of tsunamis and earthquakes off your shores, but they only they will indicate of a spiritual shaking that's begun in your land. You've built your airports too small. It's broadened the airport. You just, you've made your transportation, your bus system too small. Your new rail system is too inadequate because they're gonna come from the ends of the earth to witness what God has done in your midst. And friends, any place, any time, right here in Wasilla, Alaska, the God of Panama is not just the God of Panama. He's your God. He's my God. He's our God. And he longs to come down and kiss and embrace his people. So will you stand with me tonight, this morning, sorry. I do evangelistic service at night, and somehow nights get stuck in my head. Amen, Lord. 
Father, these are your people tonight, this morning. The people of the Lord. The sheep of your pasture. What you're doing among the nations, Father, you can do right here in our midst. You're not a God of far off. You're not a God of the past or a God of the future, the God of the now. You're the eternal I am. And as the mighty I am of God, minister among us here this morning, Lord God. Rent the heavens, come down in tabernacle among us, Lamb. Let the spirit of the living God hover over us, Lord God. Let's be swept up into that dimension of Holy Spirit, unctionized worship and praise that transcends time and lays hold on eternity. Let the heavens be bent no near and kiss the earth, Lord God, with your power, with your purity. Mm-hmm. Father, I just pray this morning for that inflammation in the joints, Lord God, that the oil of your Holy Spirit, just one drop, just one drop, Lord, just one drop, touch those inflamed joints, loose, loose them. That irritated irritated bowel syndrome, Lord God, Pour in your oil and your wine. Heal and mollify. Lamb of God, that back condition this morning, that's that pinched nerve. Father, that's that sporadic spasm of the nerves, the muscles, Lord God. In Jesus' name, touch, touch that, touch them, Lord God. All things are possible to him that believes. We believe you, Jesus. We receive of you, Jesus. We praise you, Jesus. Like the one leper returning, we come back to worship you. We come back to bow before you in adoration and praise and exaltation because you, Lamb alone, are worthy of diadem and glory. Thank you, Lord, for who you are in this generation, this last generation before you return. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. If you're here this morning and need a touch in your body, we just come in the red zone. I love that red zone. I'm going to call that the Holy Ghost zone. Amen. Just step inside. God will meet you here. Draw nigh to God, and he, God, will draw nigh to you. If you have need within your body, we just come just now. Mmm, Sunday. God is in this house. He's inhabited the praises of his people. Oh, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Thank you. Thank you, brother. They don't make Velcro like they used to. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Those of you still in the pew, stretch a hand out to these, your brothers and sisters that have come. Ooh, Hands of faith, hands of believing, arising to you, Lamb of God. Fire, fire of your precious Holy Spirit. Father, it points a pain in their bodies. Let them there know the infusion of your holy fire. Let the fire of God burn out any attack of the enemy, any assignment of hell arrayed against them, made neutral, null, and void by the power of the blood of Jesus, God's eternal covenant son. Arthritis, I command you to leave. Uramashidamasundai. Uramashidamasundai. Mm, injury, that automobile injury, that whiplash. God, in Jesus' name, make them whole. Glorious one of Israel. Mm, We've heard the doctor's report, but Lord, let our ears be open just now and the spirit man rise up to hear the spirit's report. The spirit says, I'm making you whole. Mm, Ramashidamasundai. What they tried to do with their best intentions, Lord, one medication after the other has failed. You are now doing by the power of your spirit, and we give you honor and glory for it, Lamb of God. In Jesus' name. Jesus' name. Mm, 
Mama Sunday. In Mexico, Sarah had a dream, and there was a man with a white raiment on with a nail print in his hand that came to pray for a sister in the church with two throat operations, one on each side of the throat. The next morning in the service, the pastor's daughter presented herself, the worship and praise leader of the church, for seven years. She had an operation in my voice box, one side and on the other. One side's healed quickly. The other hasn't healed as yet. So we reached into Sarah's little purse. We anointed her with oil. And within two seconds, the Lord healed her, and she hits a high C. The whole church began to weep. They recognized that voice touched by the oil of the Holy Spirit. And once again, she was able to sing the song of Zion and praise God. Friends, let's lift your hand by faith to the heavens. Lord, as we stretch out to you, author and finisher of our faith, reach back down to us, Lord God. Let the presence of your Holy Spirit, like electricity, go into the points of our body that need healing, into that duodenal ulcer, Lord God, that bleeding ulcer. In Jesus' name, heal and mollify it. That twisted limb, that torn limb, you said in Hosea, that what you have torn, you shall heal. Father, let healing flow into that ankle. Loose the fountains of the deep. Let our voice be strong and clear. That voice box problem, that throat injury. Father, in Jesus' name, let the oil of your Holy Spirit come down that voice box just now. Healing on the way. Let cells of disease know the rebuke of your nostrils and healthy cells be birthed and born of God. Let your hand of grace be stretched out over your people to do them wonders. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his awesome and wondrous works to the children of men. Thank you, Lamb of God. Thank you, Lamb of God. If God has touched you, give Jesus all the praise, all the glory, all the honor, all the worship. He alone is worthy. He alone is worthy. And then let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Go out and share your faith in the highways and byways. Bring friends and family in. We're going to have an awesome time on Monday. We're just going to just continue on in the presence of the Lord. But if God is your Savior and your Lord and your healer, tell the world. Tell the world. I'm unashamed, Paul says, of the name of Jesus, for it's the power of God unto salvation. If you've been saved, you've got a testimony. You've been blood bought, you've got a testimony. The world's waiting to hear it. Share it wherever you go. Unashamed, unashamed, unashamed. And then he says, I'll not be ashamed of you before my angels which are in heaven and my Father. Hallelujah. Father, these are your children. We are your redeemed. We're the sheep of your precious pasture, Lord God. So I just pray the sealing of the Holy Spirit comes down on us. That this week, the first day of the week, will be a week of release. Release. Ooh, mm. Somebody's finance has been held back. A sale, a mortgage sale is coming through. It's going to be bigger than you thought. Father, in Jesus' name, loose it by the hand of your power. Mm. Loose it, Lord God. Let your grace and your mercy, like streams of the Negev, flow through your people. Thank you, Lord God. As we share your love for us, as we declare it brazenly and boldly to a world in darkness, we turn the lights on wherever we go. The light of life in Christ. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for who you are. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Go ahead and hug one another. Amen. If you've received a healing... There's a transmission that comes with that healing. The Bible talks the gifts of spirit. The only place the gifts of spirit is in the plural.